sense of connection with Juanita, I do want to be respectful of the fact that I didn't know her, and there may well be people here in this room who did. And so I don't want to make broad statements about what she was or wasn't, or who she was or wasn't. But rather, I'd rather pay my respects through providing a discussion around the social and political context. The, the context for which she gave fight for justice and pay tribute to the legacies of her courage. Juanita was a publisher of the independent newspaper Now. She was also an active campaigner against the overdevelopment of Victoria Street and King's Cross. Juanita disappeared on the 4th of July in 1975. It's widely thought that she was kidnapped and murdered because of her outspoken stance against local corruption and the inappropriate development of Victoria Street. Despite having insufficient evidence to determine how she died or who killed her, a coronial inquest in 1983 concluded that Juanita was indeed murdered. The inquest also noted that it was likely that police corruption compromised the investigation into her death at the time. As a consequence, her murderers have never been brought to justice. However, her story is not a tale of tragedy. Rather, it's a story of ongoing inspiration for men and women who stand up for environmental and social justice. In order to understand and to appreciate Juanita's legacy to the environment movement within Australia, it's necessary to understand the broader context of the time. Corruption was rife in New South Wales politics and the police in the 1960s and 70s. Money was readily exchanged and backdoor deals were made to shore up development approvals for large-scale developments. Developers with big money held power. Verity Bergman, who has written extensively about the Green Man movements and the role of unions at this time, describes the period as a story of the destruction of Australia's major cities in the 1960s and early 1970s, when vast amounts of money were poured into the property development. Giant glass and concrete buildings changed the face of our cities, and valuable old buildings were raised in the process. The interests of home buyers and architectural heritage lost out before often purely speculative construction. At one stage, there were 10 million square feet of office space in Sydney's business district, while people looking for their first homes or flats could find nothing. It was out of this context that the Green Bands emerged. The Green Band movement shifted the power back to the people by placing industrial actions imposed by unionists at the centre of non-violent campaigns. These united union members, environmentalists, residents and students. The alliance was both revolutionary and fundamental in the development of the Greens as a global political movement. The Green Man celebrated many successes. They prevented the reckless destruction of low-cost housing, bushlands and heritage buildings as well as fast-tracked improvements in planning the environmental laws at this time. They were called green bands rather than black bands to emphasise the environmental objective and to evoke positive rather than defensive perception. Anne Turner in her book on union power states that, quote, green instead of black was considered more truly descriptive of this form of environmental activity because of the imposition of a green band had so much more positive social and political implications than the more defensive connotations often associated in the public mind with black bands. The Green Bands movement began in 1971 with an action to save Kelly's Bush in the affluent Sydney suburb of Hunters Hill. I'm pleased to say that I was visiting Hunters Hill just last week and was heartened to see that it still retains its leafy splendour to this day. A group of 13 women from Hunters Hill, who with the assistance of the Builder Labourers Federation, were able to challenge and stop the A.B. Jennings housing development on the last remaining area of native bushland on the foreshore of the Taramata River. The BLF applied a green ban to the area, and this ban demonstrated that concern for the preservation of the environment affected all levels of society. In 1983, the then Premier of New South Wales announced that Kelly's Bush would be set aside for full public access on a permanent basis. 
The second green ban was imposed in late 1971 in the rocks. This ban imposed by the BLF was called for by residents who held grave fears about the plans for a massive high-rise urban development in the historic precinct. By 1974, there had been 42 green, uh, green bans imposed in Sydney challenging inappropriate developments on grounds of environmental and social justice. However, it was the most bitter and violent campaigns associated with green bans that we're here to speak of tonight. It was against the destruction of Victoria Street's terrace houses in King's Cross. The tree-lined street that provided low-cost housing was earmarked to be destroyed to make way for a luxury housing complex. The development proposal was for a complex up to 45 storeys tall. The fight went on for years with unprecedented levels of violence by the proponents and climax with the murder and disappearance of the anti-development advocate, Juanita Nielsen. The Victoria Street battle positioned residents against developers who were prepared to draw on connections with the criminal underworld of Sydney to employ brute force to intimidate and to evict tenants. The proponent, Frank Thiemann, whose links with the criminal elements are well documented, went head to head with the New South Wales BLF, who had placed the Green Band on Victoria Street in April of 1973. Armed thugs vandalised Thiemann's buildings and terrorised the residents. A foundational and local and vocal member of the Victoria Street's Residence Action Group was actually kidnapped and tortured for three days. When he returned, he was too traumatised to say what had happened to him and did not speak of the events for years. Fears for personal safety were confirmed when Juanita disappeared on the 4th of July. Juanita is thought to have become a target for Thema because of her vocal stance against the proposed development. Juanita had strong emotional connections to Victoria Street. It was the street where she grew up as a child with her family, and it was the place that she returned to after living overseas as a young adult. It was at this time that she also purchased the new newspaper, the local newspaper now. And it was thought that, and it was through her paper that Juanita was able to speak out against the injustice of Thiemann's development proposals. By all accounts, Juanita was a strong, independent woman who held the courage of her convictions. She was well known in the area, as well as among Sydney's elite, because of her ties to the wealthy Floyd family. Juanita did not align herself directly with the Residence Action Group, but rather used her voice to speak to diverse audiences through her paper. <coughs> in the lead up to her disappearance, now had become her campaign platform. She wrote articles and editorials that were highly critical of the proponents, the politicians and the government agencies involved in all aspects of the approval processes. She was tireless in her fight for justice and thorough in her investigative <coughs> journalism. Her strength and power was felt by those she challenged and plans were set in place to silence her. I would argue that despite her death, those plans failed. Juanita's voice can still be heard and her story leaves in its wake a legacy of courage that fuels new generations of social and environmental activism. The more I explored her life and her battle for social justice, the more I saw parallels, not only with my own life, but with the battles that we're all facing today. In my hometown of Newcastle, we now have a developer for a Lord Mayor. Our public assets and vital services are being sold and cut Pocket parks labelled as lazy assets are being sold off to developers and our heritage buildings and heritage trees are under constant threat. While the threats and losses may be many, they are met with active resistance. The convenient relationships between government, developers and industry are constantly being challenged by individuals and groups who, like Bonita, will not be silenced. Every time a local rag speaks out against corruption or people gather to call for social and environmental justice, Juanita's voice is echoed. Tonight she is remembered, honoured and celebrated. Her legacy has brought us together and she continues to unite and inspire.
Smith herself is indeed following in the footsteps. She's an environmental activist and feminist writer and also has been involved in the infamous Layman Street Figs campaign. And for those of you who don't know it was, it went for two and a half years to um, and also now, of course, he's fighting against coal expansion in the world's largest coal port. So, good luck. <laughs>